There we go. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you out there on the internet. Uh, I'm sitting here with Paul Selig. Well, I'm not in the same room as Paul Selig. We're halfway across the globe. Paul is in beautiful Maui, and I'm in beautiful Greece. And we're we're connecting to each other through the 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 tenuousness of the internet at this moment. Uh, so it's really such a pleasure to to have you here, Paul, with me. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. How, how has Maui been treating you? I mean, it's beautiful. You know, I'm 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 in this beautiful place up in a mountain. I've been in self quarantine for almost two weeks, so. I've seen one friend that I waved to across the patio and have a coffee with. And other than that, it's been me and the, the chickens and the roosters. You're going to hear them through this. They're, they're all over. It's quite something. I, I first encountered you, as I wrote in my posting on Facebook, in, uh, in 2012, right during the Mayan New Year, when everyone was excited and waiting for the world to end. Yeah. You were in the basement of my healing center teaching a three-day workshop, and it was my introduction to your work. Mm -hmm. and that There's a car passing me by. That worked to baby. That's I'm why. That work to baby became uh, so much about the, the the rapid expansion of our paradigm how it was mm -hmm. changing. It became a tool set for, for yeah. rapid change. And in some ways, it was a fascinating work and it was very personally ac applicable to my own life. But suddenly we find ourselves in a moment when the whole world yeah. is yeah. with the structures and foundations changing yeah. and reforming. Well, that's what they've been talking about. I mean, they've been talking about that since they began dictating the books through me. You know, I'm you know, I'm a channeler, I take dictation, and I work with these guides that dictate books. And, you know, the last number of books were done live in front of groups of students. When they brought through the first book in 2009, they said, you know, humanity is at a time of reckoning, and a reckoning is a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And that everything that really didn't have its basis in truth was going to sort of have to be renown or reconceived in a higher way. And as the books have continued, and there are now seven of them in print, I think, um, they've really escalated that message. And they've been talking a lot about the restructuring of everything that we've known. Um, I mean, and they, this has been a rather urgent message. You know, the guides I work with are not gloom and doom. They're not apocalyptic. They do say we have choice, and how we, we operate through these times is really going to be somewhat uh, directive of our survival, you know, really as a species, because in the way that we've been going is not going to ensure the well-being of anyone or anything. So they've been calling us to task for quite some time about how we treat one another, how we treat ourselves, you know, and all of the sort of systems that we've relied on so heavily to to dictate what our reality is. And those are the things they're saying that are really shaking right now. So I, I, I feel that we're in this astonishing moment of change right now, unprecedented, astonishing moment of change and how we attend to it in many ways will sort of see us through. The guides have been saying, you know, <clears throat> when there's a wave best to ride it, best to ride the wave you really can't run from it and you really can't you know sort of just fight it and be be struck down by it but you can ride it and you can move through it and um i mean that's how i'm understanding this right now but there's a lot of information in the book of truth which they dictated right before the last presidential election i mean they that they really just said get ready everybody you know it's all about to happen and um and they said, you know, that the, the, the vibration of truth is actually here. And what it's going to do is destabilize everything that is not in truth. The guides say, in truth, a lie will not be held. In the vibration of truth, a lie will not be held. And so the first step of that seems to be the exposure of all this stuff. You know, they say it's akin to pulling back a bedspread and seeing the 
the bed bugs that have always been there that we've been choosing to ignore because it wasn't convenient to us culturally or you know personally to see but i think right now things are in somewhat stark relief and hopefully will continue to be so and that's not to blame people or to punish things it's just that nothing gets healed when it's hidden in darkness that's not how things get healed they have to be seen first and then they can be lifted they can bend to lift it is to bring the presence the guide say the presence of the divine to it you know a blessing is the presence of the divine upon what you see and the guides have said for a long time what you damn damns you back what you bless blesses you in return and that this is opportunity now so i don't know where that all came from but that's sort of you know yeah that's how i'm understanding this moment when we were channeling in that basement of the center in san francisco when everybody said the world was about to end i hadn't gotten that at all you know it was i'm thinking well I, i'm not just not getting that i'm not people were saying why are you doing events on december 12 2012 i said because I, I i need to work and i enjoy my work and this is an opportunity to work in a really cool place and it was actually a really great workshop as i recall so you know they do their thing and i got to meet you so that was nice yeah that was, and, and me, you know, my, my whole family, I think, is online right now watching. Uh -huh. My, my sister-in-law, Lisa, really enjoyed your books, and then Julie, Judy, oh, they're all here. So, oh, hello, family. Yeah. In fact, in some ways, Lisa outpaced me. Uh, she's been holding groups that- Oh, that great. Are, or study groups, and she, she's been helping me catch up. She helped me form some questions for today, so I want to- Oh, wonderful. Um, one of the things, you know, um, one of the things you dive deeply into to kind of form the the preparation for dealing with rapid paradigm shift is working, talking about fear. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get a whole life of fear. There's a truck going past me. <laughs> the gardener truck. You did a whole live stream of peace and you really dealt with fear. Yeah. Well, they did one in fear, and then they did one in peace right after it. And boy, their timing couldn't be better, I have to yeah. say. Well, they do talk a lot about peace, well, about fear. Was that the question? Was that what you were yeah. asking? Yeah. yeah. One of the things I, I really appreciate that you articulated the difference between acting in a, a tactical manner and, and viewing things from an objective, spiritually aligned place, but also not getting your, not, you know, walking carefully among alligators is kind of the yeah metaphor. well i mean the guides teach prudence this isn't about being foolhardy this isn't about saying boy my vibration's so high nothing's you know going to affect me I and mean, the guides say yes you have a high vibration if you walk into the shark pit you're probably gonna get eaten up you know i mean it's not it's not about some sort of grandiosity of of one's attainment prudence i think is is it's not fear it's it's discernment truthfully and nothing more than that and discernment is a tool set um i i was taught many years ago by somebody you know i said well, what's the difference between judgment and discernment and she said well you know when you when you stack the dishwasher you put the knives face down and that's because you don't want to reach in and bloody your hand pulling them out it's a very simple thing there's nothing wrong with the knife itself the knife is simply a tool you're not judging the knife but you're attending how you deal with it you know in these times when we're being invited to be fearful um i mean the guides i work with have said more than almost anything else they've ever said they've said the action of fear is to claim more fear and every choice we make in fear gets us more of the same and I believe that, and I can look right back at my life and look at every choice I've made, including some fairly recently, and go, oh, brother, now I know. Why? You know, because I was, I was acting in fear. It's got its own trajectory. They say, you know, love has its own trajectory as well. Every choice made in love will, will continue to see you through. So when I look at where I am right now with all this stuff, I have choices. I can choose to be in my discernment. I am you know, choosing to, you know, to, to self-isolate right now. You know, you're supposed to do that when you come to this state. You know, when you come to Hawaii right now, they want you to do that. And, and I respect that. And I think it's a wise thing to do. And I'm grateful that I'm not in Manhattan right now, which is where I live. 
you know, and I had a place that I was offered to come stay. And I'm really grateful for that. So I made the choice, not out of fear, but out of discernment to be here. You know, I knew what I would be walking into if I went back home, which, you know, could have been really challenging. And, you know, here was opportunity. So we're invited to fear all the time. And this is the funny thing, you know, the guides I work with have said, you know, you can learn through fear. I mean, you're, you can learn through it if you want to. It's just not the best teacher. The okay. guides do this thing where they bring people to what they call the upper room. And they say the upper room is the octave. They talk about octaves above the one that we express in vibrationally. And they say, you know, every song, every note can be sung in higher octaves and other octaves up into infinity, you know, just because your ears can't hear it. And, you know, you can't make the sound with your voice doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And they say we're operating in a collective. And this is the collective reality that we operate in as an octave. It has high and low notes. And everything that we see, we're in accord with. In accord, they say a C C O R D or a C H O R D is on a piano, meaning vibratory resonance. Everything we see is in agreement to this octave. And what they're doing is they're lifting us to what they say is the octave above. And, you know, they call, they, they, they call it different things. They call it the upper room. They call it Christ mind at other times. But it's a very interesting thing because when you go to that place of vibration and they, they teach you how to go there, it's not hard. Um, you're not frightened. There's no fear there. I mean, I'll do workshops and they'll bring, you know, 100, 200 people up to what they call the upper room. And they'll say, what are you afraid of? And nobody's afraid. It's a trip. And when you're not afraid, you're not making choices in fear. Now, that doesn't mean you've lost your discernment. You know, that doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, I don't know, you know, walk into traffic and say, I'm not going to get hit. You know, maybe you won't. But why, why do that? You know, I don't think that's the point of this. So, you know, the teachings of fear have been prominent through all of their books and all of their teachings. And they do say very simply that we have choice with this you know they say what you shake hands with you hold when you shake hands with is what you agree to what you hold you're in alignment to and if you're shaking hands with fear you're going to go down that road but you don't have to you just don't have to agree to it so it's been i've been a witness to these teachings for a number of years and i mm -hmm. even that i found myself almost like my animal instinct kicking in Mm -hmm. And walking around my environment, looking at things like, is that a germ built thing? Is that what something people have touched? And finding that, that borderland between letting my tactical brain do its thing to protect mm -hmm. me and actually residing in that energy of fear, is, it's, it's, it's interesting to find your way across that border. I'm not, you know, I'm not great with it. I mean, in, with this thing which is so interesting because it's invisible, you know, and so is fear. You know, if you want to think of fear as a, a disease or a virus, and the guides have actually called it that in prior teachings, fear is a virus. We can, I mean, you can certainly find, you know, a, a way to literalize the metaphor. It's there, you know. Now, I don't have to agree to the virus, but I can respect the fact that it exists, and that I can do what I can, you know, people, I do these groups, you know, all over the place, you know, and I have to say this, you know, for people who don't know who I am or what I do, I'm a channeler. I'm not a spiritual teacher. I'm not a guru. I couldn't care less. It's not my thing. Somebody else gets to do that stuff. I'm happy to show up for what I do and my work, which is simple. I'm the channel for these guides and I work psychically and I help people that way. Um, what was I going to say before I went on that little, you know, diatribe, there was something I was going to say, and I completely forgot it. It was actually important. Oh, I remember what I was saying. I do these prayer of protections in these groups, you know, and I've done them since the beginning, since I started doing these things when I was in my early 30s and teaching college, which was my career for most of my life. And people would say, well, why are you doing a prayer of protection? You know, everything is God. Your God say everything is God. And I said, well, yeah, everything is. But, you know, it's 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 basic hygiene 
So I say, you know, it's kind of like if it's raining, it's nice to have an umbrella. I'm an advocate of safe sex. You know, I think it's a good thing to have, you know, to and to, to practice. I think it's basic stuff, you know, and that does, and so it's just about not being cavalier. And I say in my work, you know, I'm a clear audience. I hear these guides. There are a lot of people out there probably who'd love to be talking at me. And just because they want to talk doesn't mean I need to be in conversation with them. And I'm talking in in the, you know, the higher realms, yeah. you know, like my grandma, and I always say this one, you know, my grandma was married for at least four times and she's on the other side and she's not who I would go to for relationship advice, even though she probably has a lot to say. She didn't get it right. I don't know if she has it right now, you know, or if there is a right. Yeah. So the fear stuff and, and the discernment stuff, I think it's, it's, it's practice. I had a fascinating experience of myself. I left New York to go to Costa Rica to do this retreat that I would have canceled, I think, had the news changed a day or two before, but it didn't. And so suddenly I'm on a plane to Costa Rica and there are people coming and the world changed radically over that week we were together, including, you know, I mean, really, it was amazing. And when I left and I almost stayed in Costa Rica because I had friends there who were asking me to stay. But I was like, in my discernment, need to be back in the States. If something happens, you want access to a hospital, you know, you want access to your bank account. You know, I mean, I did all the, I did all the practical things and I and I found myself you know, on a plane from Liberia, two planes, one to Dallas and then one here to Maui, watching this completely different world than the one that I had left. And I left with my bag for the week in Costa Rica. It's been, you know, it'll be coming up on a month soon, I suppose, that I've been living out of that bag. But I did everything that I was taught to do. You know, I had my gloves, I had my mask, I had, I wiped things down. And I, I, I don't want to say that I was scared out of my mind. I, I wasn't. Um, I sure wasn't comfortable, but I was suddenly operating in a reality that I hadn't agreed to. It just suddenly, this is the new reality. It's like, okay, how do we do this now? And, you know, now it's a little time in and, you know, there are certain things that I'm doing quite naturally. And I don't feel that they're fear based. I feel that I'm being in my discernment until we know more. You know, why not? I mean, I remember because I'm of that age when I because I was in college when AIDS hit and nobody knew what it was and there wasn't a name and nobody knew how you got it. And, and, you know, and I was working in a bar, you know, at the time, and suddenly people were just disappearing off of their bar stools. And I was 20, 21 years old. And the fear was rampant. And so some of what's going on now is unfortunately familiar to me, having lived through, you know, something like that, which was painful and terrible and, and, and heartbreaking in all ways. But I also think that as the gay community learned a hell of a lot at that time, a hell of a lot. I think humanity is going to learn a hell of a lot this time. I really have tremendous, tremendous hope for what can happen. I mean, the guides are, that I work with are teaching this as a tremendous opportunity. And they're not in the least bit surprised, you know, but that's them, you know. So anyway. <laughs> well, uh, you know, one of the things you, you, you did these these live streams, you have a, 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 a subscription that people can get very current up to date teachings. Yeah. And one of the things that came through is you were talking about knowing that virus as an idea. And I love that because and I'm wondering, there's so there's so many competing competing messages on the internet right now, people popping up and saying, viruses can't kill you, or viruses will do this, or viruses is that, and people attacking those people and people believing those people. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody's trying to find some sense of control. I think that's what this is about. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, that's what I think. I'm not going to judge it, you know, and I'm not going to land on either side of it. Um, but the guides say everything is an idea. You're an idea. I'm an idea. You know, the tree is an idea. It's been named tree. We call it tree. It has properties that a tree has because we're all confirming the narrative around tree. And finally, they say, everything is one energy anyway. And it's just in varying forms of articulation. And they would say, God is tree, God is sky, God is Eric. 
you know, there's one vibration, they say one note playing that is presenting itself or out picturing in all of these different ways, all these ideas in manifestation. So they do talk about, they did say, and I don't remember, the, I don't remember 80% of what comes out of my mouth when I'm channeling, which is hard and also a relief because I think my head would explode. There's just so much material, but they did say, yes, virus is idea. You know, and I, I don't think that they're meaning virus is metaphor. I think that finally, how we see anything and the properties we endow it with, whatever that is, creates our relationship to it. To understand that. So the guides have said, because they talk about lifting things to the upper room, you know, they say anything can be lifted to a higher level of vibration, which they say is alchemy. And that's their book that's coming out in August which now I understand when they were dictating it, I was like, what the hell is this? And now it all makes perfect sense what this book was about. But they say you can't lift the evil man to the upper room. You can't lift somebody evil to the upper room because you have made him evil, you see. And by claiming the man is evil, you have aligned to the man at that level of vibration. So I'm going to say one of my friends were passing in a truck. My friends are actually going surfing, although the beach is closed and, I didn't say that, but I think that's where they're going because I see the airports the <laughs> on the truck. Um, you can't lift the evil man to the upper room. And um, I suppose it goes back to this very simple idea of what you damn damns you back. So if I want to damn the virus, um, which I personally would like to do, uh, you know, but then I move to a level of co-resonance with that thing at that level. Do you understand that as the idea? To lift the idea is to change my relationship to the thing. So the guides say when they talk about you know lifting the upper the, the man to the evil man to the upper room, you have to in some ways deconstruct the man and all of the properties you've endowed him with, which is you know, the societal meaning of evil and the blame and you know the need to be right. I mean, the guides talk about the true self, which they say is the divine self and the small self, which they don't denigrate, but they say that's the personality structure. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not who we really are. It's who we think we are. It's the idea of who we are. And um, what was I going to say about this? This Anyway, I don't know what I was about to say. Something about the true self and you know, the small self. Well, the true self knows and the small self thinks. So the true self, as you align to that, knows who another is because he hasn't been indoctrinated with the narrative of what should be and all of the, the paradigms around duality. So anyway, I'll leave that over there. Jen, you can't let the, the upper room. Jen, yep. Jen asks online, if you think the man is evil, can you even be in the upper room? Well, I mean, you, it, it becomes an opportunity to lift. I mean, I think that question's answered in the new book, and I struggled with it. And I actually think at a certain point, because I thought you couldn't be in the upper room. And they said, no, you can be there to do the work of it. Yeah. You can go there to do the work of it. But you see, it's like this. I mean, this is one of the metaphors they gave. I was teaching at Esalen in December. And i got to say, everything since then the shit just hit the fan, my life, everybody's life, and now the collective life, you know, it's like, what the hell is this? But one of the metaphors was of being lifted, you know, and they, they I mean, people talk about ascension, the guides talk about lifting, uh, maybe they're talking about the same thing, I suppose they are. But they say, if you, you say, but imagine you're lifting and you have these little black pebbles in your pocket, these little black pebbles of, of anger or rage or recrimination or shame, it doesn't matter what they are. Now, you can lift up to a point with those things, but they're gonna, you're, you're going to have to turn your pockets inside out eventually if you're going to remain there. Because if you don't, whatever those little black pebbles are, are going to continue to magnetize to you what exists in the lower vibration. So you get getting pulled down and down and down. So it all becomes opportunity. Now, the metaphor that I've seen recently is basically being, you know, held up by your feet and getting shaken with all the pebbles coming out right now. It's a tremendous opportunity, but that's what it feels like. And I don't know if we're just in this astonishing moment of collective awareness, uh, astonishing moment. I don't know if we all go back to sleep if and when this thing resolves itself. But I have to tell you, 
I'm noticing levels of kindness that I've never seen before from people, you know, and an awareness of value. I mean, you know, they're applauding in New York City all of the, you know, the necessary workers every night at seven, the medical teams. And, you know, I mean, the whole city is hanging out the windows, banging on pots and pans in recognition of these people. And I, a friend of mine's grandson works in a grocery store in Rhode Island. You know, he stocks the shelves. And, um, and you know, people are being valued in a different way. And why the hell weren't they two weeks ago? Do you know what I mean? And who gives a shit how many followers you have on Instagram? And who cares? You know, who cares, really? And in a way that becomes a tremendous opportunity for relief What the guide said in the book that's coming out. So this was channel last year. And a lot of the book I think that's coming out was an anticipation of these times, but they said the masquerade ball is over. It's ending. The masks are coming off. The costumes are being dropped. The orchestra is just stopping this, the song. The music's not playing anymore. Then what do you do without the old dance? without the old song to dance to. And then this becomes great opportunity, great opportunity, great opportunity to know who we truly are, to know who others are. And I'm not saying any of this is convenient. None of this is convenient. The guide's teachings have never been convenient. I and mean, God knows what we're all going through right now is painful and awful. And people's lives are being destroyed you know at least at a certain level and some lives are ending and then i you know i have to pull back even farther to this whole you know, real understanding you know people die you know none of us are guaranteed this you know we don't even value that most of the time we're too busy looking at who we should be you know the guides have said the days of should are ending because should is always based on some kind of historical precedent. You can't have a should without something that preceded it. And without shoulds, suddenly we're back into this present moment without a criteria, you know, of how we should be or what we should do. And then perhaps we get to be, and in our being, we get to know. And the guides say the true self knows, the small self thinks. And the guides say when one is acting from one's knowing, one is always in alignment, truthfully. They're always in truth. Anyway. I feel like when your teaching started to unpack in my brain, it felt like the difference between going from consumer math to algebra. Whereas consumer math is the tangible, it's like what is known, the historical precedent, the possibility that we tread. And mm -hmm. algebra is is being able to work with the intangible, the, the, the something that you haven't known yet, the something that you haven't seen yet, but it's more real than anything else. And I feel like it's, it's like algebra for me. It could be. I mean, I flunked algebra, I think. I think I was, you know, I, I used to, when I, nobody knew these things when I was a kid. I mean, I, so for, I mean, there was a period where I'm sure I was stoned and for my freshman year and I would just go to sleep on the desk. But I used to eat these bowls of cereal with a pound of sugar on top. And by the time I hit my first period, which was math, my head was on my desk. I was asleep. I couldn't hold it up. So I missed all of that. And, you know, if they hadn't invented calculators at a certain point, I never, you know, I would have just been, I would have been on the street. So it is... I'm not going to say, I think what the guides are teaching is extraordinarily simple. Ultimately, it's too simple almost for us. And, you know, what in order for us to begin to understand this language that they're teaching, we do have to, in some ways, become willing to let go of the old ideas. And I think all we can do is become willing. I cannot make myself forget what the, I don't know, the, the collective agreement to beauty is, the collect, or the collective agreement to what success should look like. But ultimately, those are ideas. They're just ideas that we're all in confirmation to, and mostly because we think we should aspire to these things. You know, I, I don't read other channeled work. I read half a Seth book when I was in graduate school in between drinking bottles of NyQuil, you know, that's what I used to do at night, get stoned at NyQuil and read, you know, 
after the clubs closed in New Haven in my wild youth. Um, but I don't read other stuff. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, outline what you want and tell the universe exactly what you want. And I don't have any problems with that, except most of what people are aspiring to are what they think they should have, you know, and it's because that's what they were told to want. Yeah. You know, I should have a hot boyfriend. I should have, you know, the best house on the block. Well, there's nothing wrong with the best house on the block. Somebody gets to live there. But why do you want it? And if you want it so that you can be the envy of your neighbors, you're operating in fear and you're contributing to the problem. Do you understand? Nothing wrong with having a wonderful, joyful life and, 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 and receiving, you know, the gifts that are present to all who can say that it's potentially there. But I think that, you know, when the guides say the true self knows, I suspect they also say when you're, when you're aligning at that level, you, be, you become receptive to what you truly require in a higher way, not what you think you should get. And this strange moment of turnaround right now, it's fascinating, you know? I mean, the guide said when I was, you know, I was channeling in Costa Rica through this whole thing. They spoke about it every day. We put a cup, one or two of those lectures up online, I think, uh, for, for just people to, to see on YouTube. But one of the things they said was, you know, this is going, you know, they said, some of you will actually find love in this strange period. And I'm thinking, oh, is that me? Wouldn't that be nice? But they said it's because the criteria that you mandated for love will not be in effect. You're going to actually see who other people truly are beyond, you know, do they have a good job? Do they like what I like? You know, are my parents going to approve of him? You know, all the crap that we walk around with that we have been indoctrinated with. So, again, let's just go back to that idea of we're being shaken by our feet and little pebbles are coming out of our pockets. And when we are without those little pebbles, are a whole lot lighter with a whole lot more choice, finally, and freedom. I hope. Yeah, I feel like we're, we've been in this car and the car has gotten into a pretty sizable fender bender accident and all the, the decorative bumpers, they're gone. You know, yeah. the pretty ornaments on the side, gone, but we're seeing what's the steel. We're seeing what really are structures we can, we can depend on. Well, what we can depend on and also what we've given far too much power to. Yeah. You know, I mean, the financial inequity that we've been in agreement to in this country is, is astonishing, if you think about it, you know. And, I mean, it's everything that people are talking about this, you know. But, you know, I mean, the guides have been sort of teaching social action, which surprised me for about the last three or four books. They've really – and this is what I didn't know that they were doing in these books. I thought that they were writing these little personal books on spiritual alignment. And that was never, ever, ever their, their, their criteria, their mandate. They've always been teaching about collective change, but the collective change that begins at the level of the individual. Um, and that is really, you know, what this is about. So the things people are talking about now, you know, the guides have been talking about for some time and people were talking about it before the guides were ever talking. So I don't give them any sense of authority on this, but you know, we're suddenly in a moment where we realize everybody needs health care. Everybody needs it. You know, everybody needs it. It's not right. You know, it's never been right to let your neighbor go hungry. It's never been, been right to hoard your wealth, you know, but this is the culture. And the guides I work with say again and again and again, you know, that the action of fear is to claim more fear, but... You know, all of these other things, greed and judgment, all of these things are just fear in other, other ways. They say the only problem humanity really faces is what they call the denial of the divine. That's it. Everything else falls under that. If you're hoarding your food, that means you're denying, you're denying the source of all things, you know, which they would call God, or they can say call it whatever you want, doesn't matter to them. You know, um, you know, if you're judging your brother, which they say you can do what you want. I mean, we have free will, but you know what you judge, you damn and what you damn damns you back. It's really simple, really simple. And then you're the one in low vibration. They even say 
and this is a bitch for everybody who wants to get on a soapbox, including me sometimes, you know, self-righteousness is always the small self, always the, the personality self. You know, the true self doesn't need to be right. It doesn't have anything to prove. It really couldn't care less what others think of him or her. You know, I'm not there yet, but I understand the teaching. Mm. Yeah, that's a very useful idea, especially in times of great political strife. Because mm -hmm. some of the solutions aren't aren't found in one place. They're found through a weaving. Exactly know, so. right. I agree with you there. By the way, uh, your fan, Natalie Servin, says she's really enjoying hearing you curse occasionally. She said you, ah. you've been more relatable because I think she's feeling some similar things. And well, I, that's nice to hear. <laughs> I, I think it's because it's Facebook Live and I'm not producing this event. It's an interview with a friend. So, you know, I'll drop she a few more in. Yeah. She always said when, when she's being turned upside down, it's not pebbles falling out, it's entire boulders. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And some grenades are coming out of mine on occasion, too. That's not fun. But, you know, we don't get to, uh, I don't know that we have. I don't know that we have the luxury anymore of pretending. That's all. You know, they're saying say this. You know, I, I don't read other channels, but I did read because I was curious. This is many years ago, and I don't recall it. I think I gave the book away. There was a book on Edgar Cayce's predictions on the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I remember about that was... He said, well, you know, the seven seals that supposedly open are the seven chakras. And his, they said, humanity has a choice. And I completely agree with this, that we deal with our stuff personally. We, we deal with what we're holding in the varying centers. You know, we clear them ourselves. We release the judgment. We release the anger. We release the fear. Or, and this is the bad news, we get to outpicture them as a collective reality in order to deal with them. You know, so it's kind of like I can deal with things before they become a crisis, hopefully, you know, or I can say, I don't want to deal with this or this isn't really a problem or whatever. And eventually it's going to bite me in the ass. And, you know, that seems to be, well, one way to look at some of this now. But I think beyond that, we have to grow. We have to grow. We can't go on as we were. I don't think it's I don't think it's. It's easy to close your eyes, go back to sleep, but I don't think we get to anymore. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, your guides in, in your la your most recent live stream talked about uh, the body, or maybe it was in the book. It's the body not not being the only vehicle that human beings are expressed through, and so much of the work I do is getting people embodied. You know, I, I even think of you know referencing your connection to truth through the body. Um, and this statement really put a big question in my head. Never have we been more like Neo in his little pod in the beginning of the Matrix, wired into the internet as we are right now. And I wondered if th this is somehow talking about how we're connecting through the internet. It even maybe like a like, are we going to be expressing ourselves outside of our body? Are you talking about a psychic instrument? Or are you talking about technology? Maybe. I'm not sure. I, I you know I. I got it. I got dinged on the computer, which distracted me for a second. Um, but is the question was the question about sort of operating beyond the body and what that really means? Well, let me say this. You know, I work when I'm ch I'm a radio. That's my work now. You know, I used to be a college teacher. I guess I was a radio then. I was just playing different teachings. You know, but I'm a radio for the guides. And when I work psychically, I'm a radio for other people. So people mostly know my channeled work, but I make my living, honestly, sort of spending the day, some days, tuning in. Somebody will call me and say, you know, I'm having problems with my, with my marriage, what's going on with me and my husband. And I can step into the husband, I can step into the wife, I can tune in and have the whole conversation that's happening at a higher level privy to me, you know, and I find that fascinating. But what it means is we're just not this body. You don't need the body to do that, you know. So I used to think that when I was, say, reading for somebody in China, I was flying to China in order to step into somebody and feel them. You know, and I sometimes I start to look like them. It's a very physical, somatized way of it's mediumship. 
And I was channeling it at the Esalen Institute, the very first time I channeled publicly, you know, at an invitational conference. And Dean Radin, the physicist, was there and he said, you know, you're not traveling to China, you're going in. And it was the first time I understood that there were, I, I, I don't know physics, I don't read them, I, I should. The guides speak about them, but I don't know what they're talking about. And I think the idea, I think the body is of God, everything is of God, and the body actually needs to lift in vibration in order to be able to hold some of what they're teaching, which is why they work with the body in various distinct ways when they do the attunements. And it's quite physical, you can feel it. But one of the things they've said about the body, which is interesting, is that we come from this paradigm where, um, you know, if there is a God, it's up there in the clouds and we're stuck here in the mud. And they said, well, you know, God is the mud too. And it's also your blood and your saliva and, you know, your spine and the skin on your, you know, everything. It's all things. And because we denied the divinity of form, and I've had a big hard time with this in my life for many reasons, um, we end up denying the divinity in the material realm as a whole. If you're denying God as form, the form you've been given, taken, you know, how can you perceive the divine in the ocean? You see, it's all an equivalency. The moment you align, and they teach this, it's fascinating, but when they teach, they call it the echo. When you align to the claim, I know what I am in truth, which is the claim of the divine in form, and then you can look at another, and, you know, do, a ten, do it from 10 feet away. I know what you are in truth. And you work with that claim. And the guy says it's a claim of truth. You can literally feel the energy roll back from the one you've just claimed it in. It's almost like the, the, a bell tolling. You can just feel the waves of, of vibration come back. And they say this is how a world is made new. You know, it's again the simple teaching of the presence of the divine is all things. You know, you're claiming you can't, they say you can't make anything holy. It's already holy, but you can deny the divine in anything, you know, and while they're doing so, there's, you know, this, they're not making us, you know, Christ. They say the Christ is the aspect of the creator that seeks realization through all, you know, that's who we truly are, who everybody is. The true self is the God self that seeks realization, but it comes at the cost of the old. It doesn't come, you know, it's why I don't understand sometimes, you know, the, the pageantry around spirituality, you know, and, you know, the cost, I, I, it's just the stuff, the accoutrements that have, 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 you know, arisen around this stuff, because it's just meaningless, you know. It's the divine is who you are anyway, 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 in spite of your shit. You know, in spite of your judgment, you're divine anyway. You know, Donald Trump is divine anyway. It kills me to say that, but he is. Because God is all things or no thing at all. Now, you know, he's in the dark. I can say that, but I don't, you know, I can keep him in the dark and keep reinforcing the darkness. Or I can begin to lift him to the light, which hopefully then something may good may come. Do you understand? But, you know, it's a hard one because I want to, you know, I don't like what I don't like. You know, anyway, I'm going to shut up before I get in trouble here. You, uh, speaking of the echo, I had a really delicious confirmation of that happen to me. I, I, mm -hmm. I think it was a day after one of your workshops. And the next day I decided to go to a little hot springs in Portland. Like they have a little sauna yeah. spa thing where, where all the wonderful hippies hang out and soak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the little cafe and I, I thought... Okay, I, I was still kind of chewing on what you taught. And as I'm just doing a transaction, you know, I'm ordering uh -huh. tea, I'm paying my credit card. In my head, I say to her, I know who you are in truth. Yeah. And she looks, she stops and she looks at me and her eyes get super large. And she said, what did you just do? I just saw a yes. green light flash from behind your body. And she was a, a very attuned kind of psychic yeah. person. That instant confirmation was was brilliant for me. It was such a good Yeah, thing. it's really nice when that happens. It really is. When I first started opening up, I used to get that confirmation too, and it was helpful. Now I, I, I sort of take it for granted. But the guides say what is true is always true. And the claim, I know who you are in truth. I know what you are in truth. I know how you serve in truth is always true. It may not be apparent, 
but at the higher level, it's always true. And they say the divine self or the God self knows who it is, knows what it is, and knows how it serves. So it's the divine as you who gets to claim that for another, because the divine as you knows that it's always true. You're not conjuring. You're not making somebody spiritual. You're just simply agreeing, frankly, agreeing, which is vibrational accord to who they truly are in a higher way. And it's remarkable. I mean, it's often very physical for people, you know, we're doing on the, um, we just decided this on the 19th, I'm going to do um, a, a three hour workshop, sort of like a pay what you can or come for free. It doesn't really matter, but I expect there are going to be thousands and thousands of people on this thing. And I can't imagine what the energy is going to be like, you know, I really can't because again, it's palpable when you work with this stuff. And I was part of the reason I like doing the workshops is I get to feel it, you know, I just get to feel it. And then it stops being this sort of private occurrence for me and becomes what it's intended to be, which is sort of this collective experience of, of a higher agreement, you know, the, the agreement to the inherent divine instead of the, uh, the denial of it, you know? So anyway, you're getting a lot of love on the, on the feed of people chatting. Wow. Lots of people are wording right now. So that, that ah. is great. Yeah. From Jet, uh, An 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 Anila says, we love you, Paul. Thank you. Oh, um, that's sweet. She's looking forward to that. Um, and and just lots of love to you coming from the live stream right now. That's nice. Thank you, everybody. It's appreciated. Uh, Michael has a question on discernment. He says, if you hear a, meteorolo a meteorologist tell you that the potential of a Cat 5 hurricane has a 20% chance of making landfall in your region, but he also mentions that his tracking tools are not always accurate, I feel it's still a good idea. Wait, I still... I, he, it was a little long, so I, could, I still feel it's still a good idea to take some action and prepare for the event. Yeah. Even the possibility are very likely over 50 50. Thoughts on fear of discernment? I think that's discernment, you know? I, I don't think that that's fear. Fear probably would be sell your house and move to another state where they don't have those kinds of hurricanes, you know? Um, I mean, I, you know, I live in Manhattan, you know, when I'm there, and I have a lock on my door. You know, um, and I don't think it's a bad idea to have a lock on your door. I sleep better with a lock on my door. You know, it's not. Uh, but the difference is I let people in to understand. I'm not saying don't come in and show me your password and, you know, all that stuff. And I don't have 10 locks on the door either, you know, which some do, which is, I suppose, maybe somebody needs 10 locks on a door. I don't know. Um, but no, I think that example would be one of discernment. You know, it's. Uh, let me, I'm going to ask the guides about this one. And I, you know, I haven't channeled on this and I don't know if I should, we will say only one thing. They're saying we will say only one thing. Discernment is understanding. Discernment is understanding. Replace discernment with understanding. To replace discernment with understanding will demystify it and you will demystify it. When you understand something, you act, you act in accordance with your understanding. Understanding is neutral, neither good nor bad, neither good nor bad and helpful and helpful. I'm in my understanding. I am in my understanding. We are understanding. When you are in your understanding, you may choose to act in fear. You may choose to act in fear, which is in low accord, which is in low accord or choose not to, or choose not to. Preparing for a storm, preparing for a storm, real or imagined, real or imagined is actually prudent, is actually prudent. If everybody says there's a storm, if everybody says there's a storm and you know in your heart there's not, and you know in your heart there is not, then don't prepare, then don't prepare, but do the best you have, but do the best you have with the information you have, with the information you have, and it tells you, and if the information tells you there's a good chance of a storm, there is a good chance of a storm. Best to close the windows just in case. Best to close the windows just in case, period. They're saying period. That's new. I didn't know that. This discernment is understanding. Perfect. That's actually much easier for me because it's not as loaded, you know? Yeah. So that was good for me. I have a question from Lisa. And she she was talking about how, you know, she, she's a therapist much like I am, and she, she mm -hmm. works with people who are processing very emotional mm -hmm. things. And she asks, as, as you are in the upper room, sometimes you see things from a more objective fashion. Yeah. You're, you're caught up in the drama of what's happening. Yeah, yeah. And she, wonders, she, she wonders about the relatability. You know, are you still relatable to people who are going through those dramas? 
Um, and do you find that you get pushback around that? No, actually, the opposite is true. You can be neutral. When I'm in my stuff and I go into my stuff and my drama, you've seen some of it over the years. You know, I can be terrified. I'm so grateful for my friends who are able to move into neutrality. So grateful for that level of reasoning, you know, and impartiality. It's healthy. It's divine neutral is what we used to call it, divine neutral. Now, part of the reason that I'm an effective reader, I don't know how this impacts the channeling, is that, you know, I've had not an easy life in some ways. I've had hard emotional times. I've had hard financial times. I've been through addiction. I've been through lots of stuff. And as a result of this, the scale of emotion that I have access to is really kind of big. And so if I tune into somebody and I feel them, I can go onto the emotional scale where they're at and recognize it. You know, I know what these things feel like. They're not other. So because I can tune in at that level, I can be in response to them. So having had the experience is one thing, but going into agreement with it, which is into agreement with a drama, in agreement with a trauma, that doesn't help anybody, I don't think. You know, some people need to be told, yes, you were hurt, and yes, it sucked, and yes, it was terrible. And I'm really sorry that happened to you. But they may also need to be told that it's not happening now. Do you know to understand in order to be able to move beyond the paradigm or to be held in a vision of worth where they can actually move beyond it by stepping into that vision Do you understand that. So we don't do a lot of good, I think, by confirming the negative. You know, I don't think that that helps people terribly, but I think that that's not about denial and it's really not about spiritual bypassing. Sometimes I wish these teachings were that they'd be a lot easier for me. But again, nothing gets changed until it's seen or understood. And I don't think that means we have to go through every injury we've ever incurred or done to another, you know, in order to to pluck away the shrapnel, I think that we go through this process and the shrapnel begins to come out anyway. And then we're going to get to feel it as it comes out. You know, it's an old Emmett Fox teaching from the, I don't know when he was teaching the 1920s spiritual shrapnel. He said that in the, uh, I guess it was in world war one, the soldiers, the soldiers were injured and the shrapnel would stay in the body. And then in time, the body would reject the shrapnel. And it would, there would be a second wound as the shrapnel was leaving. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. A second yes. pain. And I, and I like that as a metaphor for what we've carried emotionally. Mm -hmm. It gets to leave, but we get to understand it as leaving. Sometimes maybe things just go. And that's wonderful, too. You've been working. You've been witness to this work. The longest, and like you said, you know, sometimes you have to go back and read the transcript and hear the recording to get the whole study. But you've been, you, you, mm -hmm. you've been letting this unpack over time, and mm -hmm. I'm curious how you would describe this in an elevator kind of speech way to someone who's never encountered this work. I don't even know today. I, maybe last week I would have had something different to say. I think there, it's a series of teachings that support the individual and the collective in the realization of their innate divinity. And realization means knowing and expressing of. It's not a theoretical teaching. It's not a feel-good teaching. It's not even a self-help teaching. It's a teaching of the alchemization of the individual and the collective to begin to operate in a higher vibrational accord with the knowing, underline the word knowing, which means realization, as the guides say, of who they truly are. It, it feels to me somewhat like the, uh, the work of the books has also helped me wire that into the circuitry of my behavior and my perception and my thoughts. Yeah. It's taken, you know, I, I used to, I'm a better student of the work than I ever used to be right now, I think. And I have a long ways to go I, because I was channeling so often. I mean, and, and I, when I work, I mean, I'll, I'll channel for five hours in a day in a workshop and sometimes seven days in a row. I mean, it's nuts. And I just, when, when it's over, I just want to go, you know, soak in a tub or, you know, eat or not think about this. 
but I'm I'm I've been having to truthfully in in this last six months or so because it's not been an easy time, and I'm actually finding it works. You know, I knew it worked. It's not that I wasn't doing it, but I didn't run to it as a refuge. I was doing the work in the workshops. I was applying the teachings. But I'll say this. I was perhaps applying the teachings more as it was convenient to me, not as I needed to to fully realize what they were about. And I feel that I've been moved forward. I don't know how fully, but I really feel that I have. And in some ways... You know, the guide said to me, you know, there's things, and I don't know if this is true, but they said, you know, you're going to be working more publicly than you have been. And as a result of that, there are some things you're going to have to really deal with that are all about all of the reasons you want to hide under the rock, you know, because a part of me does. I'm a private person. I'm actually very shy socially, you know, and, um, you know, I, my social skills are okay, mostly, but you know, if you invite me to a party, I'll probably stand in the corner with my little plate and, and eat, you know, hover by the, the food table. Um, I'm not, you know, I mean, for me, social, whatever I'm in, self-quarantine is really easy. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. But, you know, I'm learning, learning, learning that I have to show up without some of the fear, you know, anyway, anyway, anyway. And anyway is a big word for the guides. You know, they say, love them anyway. doesn't matter what they do, love them anyway. You know, and that's, that's part of the job at hand. Love them anyway. Love them anyway. And I think if we can just do that, we'll have a much, 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 much better world. Well, we're, we're reaching about an hour. Do you have mm -hmm. any more time or do you feel like you want to wrap up now? Or I think we're good to wrap up. I think okay. I have to, yeah, I think I, I'm feeling good. You know, we, we got Natalie says socially skilled introverts unite. And uh, Don says, thank you so much for this. And, uh, and, uh, and I think somebody even asked about your little dog. <laughs> Well, Lily's in New York with, she's, she's, fortunately, she's with a sitter who's loves her dearly. So she's well taken care of. I miss her a lot right now. I don't know when I get to go home. I'm hoping it's soon. I actually moved apartments in New York when I wasn't even there. So I'm feeling very displaced and, and my dog is one of the things that, that gives me great comfort. So I'm looking forward to having her back. Can I ask one more question? It kind of pops off the page. It yeah. seems like a question. Um, it says, Mark asks, can we alchemize this virus situation by seeing and acknowledging the divinity, the divinity in it? Or is that just the desire of the small self wanting to make things better? It's not, about, it's not about making it's better, about seeing the divine. It's about seeing the divine that must expresses all things, that must expresses all things and the virulence and the virulence of the virus itself, of the virus itself, what is antagonized, what is antagonized and antagonistic and antagonistic can indeed be altered, can indeed be altered through the reseeing of it, through the reseeing of it, and what we call the upper room, and what we call the upper room. You're not denying the virus. You are not divine, de denying the virus. You're reuniting the virus. You're reuniting the divine, reuniting the virus, the virus with source, with source at a level of creation, at a level of creation, and it just is, then it just is without a name, without a name, or even without the properties, or even without the properties that it has established, that it has established, all is true, all is true in this way, in this way, a tree is of God, a tree is of God, you can re-know the tree is of God, you can re-know the tree as of God, and the alchemization of the tree, and the alchemization of the tree will actually inform the structure of tree, will actually inform the structure of tree in time your science will tell you this in time your science will tell you this and we will say it now and we will say it now nothing can be outside of god nothing can be outside of god because indeed it is all things because indeed it is all things period and they're saying period so whatever that means that was a mosquito i wasn't clapping for myself i was killing the mosquito this is my bug spray here on my little maui porch oh. Thank you. Okay. Well, all I'm right. Sure we'll read all the love for you on the on the stream here. I'm going to close the stream first and then say goodbye okay. to you. After. So all right. One second. Bye, everybody. Thank you for showing up. I really appreciate Bye, everybody. You contributing to this.